The speaker for this session is uh, Mr. Zubair Ahmed. Uh, Mr. Zubair Ahmed is a multilingual multimedia BBC journalist based in BBC India's headquarters in Delhi. His forte is field reporting covering politics, social entrepreneurship, social changes, human rights, terrorism, business, entertainment, and technology. He has been with the BBC for 25 years, during which he has worked out of BBC Bureau in Washington, DC, Moscow, Dhaka, Mumbai, and London. He has reported for many countries across the globe. Currently, he has been working for BBC Languages on the changes that the world might experience in the post-coronavirus world. He has given invited talks in various countries, and the session will be chaired by Dr. Shailendra Singh, who's working as an assistant professor in the School of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences at Aurora University. He has completed his PhD from Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi, India, and has a master's degree in English literature from Hindu College, University of Delhi. Youngest recipient of the Manakshi Mukherjee Prize for the best published academic paper in India, 2016 to 2017, awarded by Indian Association for Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies. His research includes uh, peace and narratives, gender studies, nationalist fiction, and Premchand's literary corpus. Once the session is over, the, speaker, uh, the chair will take up more questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Manjri, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, so, without further ado, we can move on to uh, listen to what uh, Zubair sir has to say. His topic is Indian workers caught between two worlds: one dead, the other powerless to be born. So over to you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can you hear me loud and clear? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. So I will then go on. Uh, <clears throat> basically, I'm a field reporter, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, the migrant laborers uh, under the lockdown. And that is because I have uh, mostly been uh, reporting on them of late, uh, mostly for um, BBC languages and not for so much for BBC English uh, website. And that is why you may not be able to see uh, much of uh, what I have been doing, but I have been doing a lot uh, on them. Uh, <clears throat> talking about migrant laborers, um, you know, it may sound a little bit uh, hypocritical. Uh, talking about them from the comfort zone of our uh, home, um, you know, um, and um, uh, the sufferings that they have been going through under the lockdown. Uh, I mean, there is no comparison, uh, but I think I have earned the rights uh, to talk about them, not just because I have been covering them for the last uh, three to four weeks, but also because uh, I have always, uh, in my 30 years of journalism, focused a lot on uh, uh, the so-called blue collar people, so-called uh, the lowest common denominator in the society. I have uh, uh, been reporting on the farmer suicide, uh, the farm widows, uh, the bonded labor, and the ordinary people who live in uh, city uh, ghettos, uh, who um, many people believe uh, that they, um, I mean, and, and I have met such people in India that they don't exist. Uh, I remember I've, I have worked in Mumbai for many years and I remember meeting a gentleman uh, who was a CEO of a company. Uh, and he, uh, when I asked him a question about uh, set up boxes, uh, which were being introduced in India then, I said, you know, uh, there will be a digital divide uh, if we introduce this. Uh, do you think poor people can afford it? And he looked at me uh, in wonderment, and I and and he he asked me, "Where do you see poor people? India is not a poor country; it is a developed country." And this was the CEO of a multinational company, an Indian person. And um, I mean, so many people may not necessarily see poverty um, in urban areas, but there are millions of them, uh, and we saw them on the streets of Delhi, on the highways, um, in, in, the, in, in all big cities after the lockdown was announced uh, on the 24th of uh, March um, at 8 p.m. when our prime minister addressed the nation. Uh, he sprung a surprise on us by announcing, announcing that from uh, midnight tonight, uh, there will be a total, a complete lockdown. Uh, as we may like to remember, 
that all modes of transport had already been cancelled, suspended. Therefore, uh, this came as a huge uh, shock to, uh, to all of uh, the uh, people here uh, because the entire 1.3 billion people uh, were under the lockdown at a short notice, a notice of three and a half hours. Um, and I think we, we, were, we were able to cope in a, in a way because we could work from home, but millions of um, migrant workers, uh, in, especially in big cities, you know, uh, as I said, in Mumbai, there are uh, uh, workers who come from uh, poorer states like Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Orissa, Rajasthan. And then, of course, you have uh, millions of such people uh, working here in Delhi. Uh, they are engaged in uh, services industry. They, they are newspaper boys. They deliver newspapers to you. They, are, they clean your toilets. Uh, they serve you food in restaurants. They cook food for you in, in homes and restaurants. So these are the uh, people working in uh, India's unorganized sector. And uh, uh, there are, uh, according to a rough estimate, there are between 100 uh, million and 150 million such people working. And, they, and, and to a large extent, uh, they are the backbone of our economy. Uh, without them, I think, uh, uh, you know, the construction sites, um, uh, restaurants, um, many other services industry will not really function properly. So I'm talking about them. So on the 24th of uh, uh, March, when the prime minister made this announcement, uh, it came as a big shock to them. And, and there was a mass exodus of such people uh, from uh, big cities like Chennai, Mumbai, uh, uh, Bangalore, and, and of course, Delhi. Uh, and we were told by, I mean, we were given guidelines not to venture out uh, because of the, obviously because of the lockdown. Uh, but I decided, when I saw images of uh, workers uh, stranded on highways, on, on wherever they could find shelter, I decided that I'm going to meet them personally, defying um, our own office guidelines. Uh, of course, I, I, I sought permission. Uh, and then I went uh, and met many, many of uh, these uh, helpless workers and I saw the, their plight uh, with my own eyes. The very first sight that I, um, I saw when I, when, I, when I went to uh, a place in Delhi uh, was um, a, a, a food van had just come uh, and the workers were uh, asked to be in a queue and there were like thousands of them. And the moment the van arrived, there was a near food riot. Uh, they were jostling with each other. They were, they were, uh, you know, uh, pushing each other to to get close to the van. And when the food was being handed out to them, and it was a lunch box at 1 p.m., uh, you know, many people just uh, tore through uh, uh, the packets and started eating like uh, as if they had not eaten uh, for days. Some of the workers I I asked, uh, they said they had. Um, they had not eaten from the previous night. Uh, so obviously uh, they were hungry and uh, they had not had their dinner, a lot of them. Some uh, told me that they had dinner, but they had no breakfast. This was their first meal of the day. And this, all this was happening barely a few kilometers, could be maybe five kilometers from the seat of India's federal government. And this was, uh, that we captured all that and we did a TV story, we did uh, an online story. I mean, this was not to shock people. This was, all, this was the reality on the streets of uh, many cities in India. This was happening all across India. And that just shows, that just showed that we were not really, we had not thought through uh, the repercussions of a complete nationwide lockdown. Uh, we had made no plans, this, and I would not blame a particular government, but I think the, 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 the government officials, state governments, uh, district uh, administrations, they were all responsible uh, to ensure their safety. They kept appealing to them to stay put wherever they are, but, uh, but, but these people 
um, had uh, suddenly realized that they have nowhere to go to work because they are daily wage. Most of them are daily wage earners. Where would they go to earn their livelihood for the day? And, uh, and, and, and uh, back home, their families depend on their daily wages. So suddenly, their economic security was taken away from them. So obviously, they panicked and they started to leave um, for their villages where they, they, they probably they would get social security. They would have the comfort of uh, being with the, their families at an unprecedented time like this. So obviously, they left in, um, in, in thousands and, and, and hundreds of thousands of them. And we kept uh, doing stories on them for a number of days. And then, uh, of course, uh, you know, the Delhi government uh, came forward and they had um, food shelters. They had shelter. They already had shelters for the poor people, but they increased the capacity where these uh, stranded uh, migrant laborers could get uh, their food and lodging. Uh, and of course, I saw that they inside, I went inside uh, the, the shelter, uh, the shelters, and I could see that the, the capacity in that particular area was for 8,000 people. And there were another 50,000 waiting outside to be accommodated in, in those uh, shelters. And, and, and of course, they had maintained uh, the, the uh, social distancing norms inside the shelters. That was, uh, that was a little pleasing to see. But uh, the, the, the government organizations, the departments were completely overwhelmed, despite providing food and lodging by uh, the Delhi government, by the Uttar Pradesh government, and uh, indeed Maharashtra government, it was not enough because they uh, were such huge in number. Uh, and many workers I, uh, I spoke to, uh, they were just, uh, they, they just seemed very frustrated and angry. And just before I had met them, there was a, there was a, a media team which, which had been attacked by them uh, because they said they were hungry and they were asking all sorts of questions and they felt frustrated and they vented their frustration on these uh, media people. Police were trying to uh, control them, but they went out of control and they attacked the media team. Fortunately for us, they were kind to us. <laughs> they, we, we were listening to them. We were not asking them questions. We were listening to them and they had a lot to say that they were hungry. They, they were worried about their loved ones uh, back home in their villages. They were worried about what will happen uh, to their livelihood now. Uh, now the country is under the lockdown. They had not even, uh, I mean, this, they, they had no concept of social distancing. So even while they were trying to queue up um, to get food, uh, you, you could see that the police uh, were trying to maintain uh, two, two meter distance between uh, two people, but that was not possible because of, there were so many of them. And they were wondering why this social distancing thing is being uh, imposed on them because they had never understood that. They have lived uh, always cheek by jowl, always close to each other, hugging them, um, hugging each other. This was, this was part of their life, but suddenly uh, these uh, things were imposed on them and they just didn't like it. So uh, this was the situation uh, when I was reporting um, on, on, on these uh, workers. And uh, uh, they, uh, they seemed like worried about their family members back home. They, uh, they were worried about their future. But more than that, they were worried about today. How will they eat? What will they eat? Where will they sleep? I mean, um, many of them sleep rough on the streets um, under the sky in Mumbai. I have worked there for many years. So I know um, they, they even sleep on the on the road dividers, uh, you will be surprised to hear that, but I have seen it with my own eyes, that there are uh, arms hanging out um, you know, on the road. So if you're driving at night and if you're not careful, uh, you might uh, meet with an accident. You might, uh, they might come under, under your uh, wheels. So this is the situation in big cities. And uh, I think this, uh, this uh, outbreak of uh, coronavirus has uh, revealed uh, one a big uh, gap in, in, in our system, and that is that uh, despite uh, plans uh, to make uh, 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 low-cost housing for them, uh, especially in big cities, uh, the governments have not been able to do that. 
uh, it, for it, for instance, uh, you know, when I was in Mumbai, Dharavi is a big shanty town uh, where the government housing uh, began many years, 15 years ago. And there are just a uh, few buildings uh, where people live and the rest of them still live in uh, the, the, in the shanties uh, that they have built uh, themselves. And uh, they are um, uh, definitely uh, uh, right now, uh, uh, there is a need for them, uh, for the policymakers to, to, to learn uh, the lessons uh, from this, that they need to uh, create uh, infrastructure for these workers, and uh, which includes uh, board and lodging. And if they don't do it, these people are not going to go back to work where they were working earlier. In fact, I spoke to a senior minister recently. I asked him how they plan, is there a plan, uh, uh, you know, the post lockdown uh, to bring those workers back to where they were working earlier in, uh, in big cities. And the minister said, perhaps for, a, for a, o, almost a year, uh, these people are not going to go back uh, to uh, the places where they were working earlier. They would rather stay in, 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 in the security of uh, their families. And uh, of course, that will create another problem for state governments, uh, uh, especially the state governments of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, uh, where these workers uh, have, are in large numbers. And I think in the, in the post-corona world, uh, a lot of things will change. And one of the things that the state governments and the, so the local administrations have to definitely think about is how they will create, they have to create jobs for them. They have to create uh, low cost housing for them if they are not going back to the big cities. And if they go back to the big cities, no, no, not all of them will go because of the experiences they've had recently. But once they uh, start going back, they will definitely need uh, to be looked after uh, and it will not do the way uh, they were being treated earlier. And I also spoke to many uh, workers who say uh, that they are not going to be exploited by the city people anymore. Uh, you know, the average wage um, in the unorganized sector is 400 rupees a day. They, they were saying that this is not going to, uh, they will not accept this. Uh, the minimum wages have to be much higher. And I remember the, uh, you know, how once I was traveling in Kerala and I found a lot of Nepalese and Biharis, the people from Bihar, uh, who were working in uh, rubber plantations um, and in, uh, in, uh, they were working as domestic help as well. And I asked uh, uh, people there why they don't have local uh, domestic help and local workers. And they say uh, local, local rates are very high. Uh, you, you know, if you are a, Kerala, a Keralaite, you will charge probably 1,000 or 1,200 rupees a day, whereas these people are cheap labor. And, and that is because, um, uh, in from, you know, Kerala is a relatively um, a, a, a state which has seen a lot of development and many people have gone to the Gulf to work and there is a relative prosperity in the state of Kerala and therefore it is hard to get um, uh, cheap labor. And that's why the, the, the laborers are expensive there. And until the time when people started going from Nepal and Bihar and started working as cheap labor, cheap labor. So that might uh, be the situation post uh, coronavirus uh, uh, time uh, when workers will have probably more rights. They will probably have uh, 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 better wages uh, and hopefully uh, they will also have, uh, uh, you know, low uh, access to low, co low cost housing, uh, primary healthcare centers, all of these uh, infrastructure the governments have to create. But right now, things, I, I don't think there is any such plan. Um, the, of course, the governments need to start thinking on those lines. Right now, they don't have jobs. They cannot go back to their uh, respective uh, places where they were working earlier. And if, uh, uh, the government has started uh, trains to take them to their villages. They will go back, they will go to the villages, stay with their families, but there is no job there. So one person who's looking after eight family members, where will he get the job from? Where will he get the money from to look after the family? So that's why I seem to um, 
think that they probably have they have they they are caught uh, as uh, the English poet uh, Matthew Arnold had once uh, said um, about his uh, spiritual journey that um, he's been caught between two worlds, one dead, the other powerless to be born. And I think that is what uh, that is the situation I find these workers, Indian uh, migrant workers, in, and that is something that policymakers need to think very hard how to bring them back to the um, the mainstream economy they have to provide facilities to them if they and if they stay decide to stay back in their villages state governments have a huge responsibility to create jobs for them and low cost uh, housing for them thank you very much okay thank you thank you sir for pointing out the cash 22 situation that the migrant workers find themselves in and especially at a time when these the people are not only alienated from the economy but also in a way seen as a dispensable part of the uh, uh, india shining narrative so so thank you for that but i'm also reminded here of professor pramod naya's article wherein he also makes a similar point to the one that you are making which is that in an uh, uh, in an age of lockdowns and social distancing these people were forced to indulge in an act of extreme mobility, which is they had to willy-nilly go for uh, travel thousands of kilometers in order to uh, reach back to their family. But as you rightly pointed out, uh, they still have to find jobs. They still have to find resources. So now uh, we could invite a, a couple of questions, please. Anyone has a question? Uh, Salenji, there is one question. And the question is, how is humanity affected in such epidemic situation? How do you see as a journalist? Uh, very uh, interesting question. I think the way I see it, uh, many people are saying, I mean, I, this has become a cliche that the world will not be the same post-pandemic, post-coronavirus uh, uh, time. Uh, many things will change. Yes, um, a lot of things will not change. Humanity, humanity has suffered. They are still suffering. Uh, thousands of people are dying every day across the globe. Uh, millions have been affected by it and the uh, world economy is completely shattered. We have also been suffering in India. Uh, <clears throat> there will be lots and lots of losses of jobs. Uh, millions will lose jobs in India. Let's talk about India. I mean, it, it, it's a developing uh, economy. It was uh, not doing that well before uh, the coronavirus uh, crisis started. But with this um, crisis uh, in progress, I think our economy is going to be badly affected. Um, I, I get messages from friends that they, they, they have um, uh, lost jobs or their salaries have been cut into half uh, and their buying power is definitely going to go down and if there is no demand in the market, if you have less money, there will be low, uh, less demand in the market. If there is less demand in the market, uh, the economy will suffer. It will not bounce back. Of course, Having said that, thus right now, uh, I am more worried about uh, the migrant workers because uh, I felt that the authorities left them to uh, mind their own businesses. Society forgot about them. The state governments did not do much about them. Now they are, of course, politicizing it. But in the beginning, nobody thought about them. And I, just before I came here, I was uh, looking at a, tw a tweet, a tweet uh, in which a video was tweeted um, uh, by somebody and uh, you know there, there is this uh, uh, mixer uh, uh, truck where uh, you know uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big uh, mixer truck where uh, cement is mixed with uh, other stuff uh, so that was that, that has a huge belly and 18 workers had been uh, put, put into that uh, they were going from Maharashtra to Lucknow and they were caught in uh, somewhere in Madhya Pradesh. So that is the desperation of the workers. And, th and th this is a huge suffering. Uh, everybody's suffering. It's not, not to say that, uh, you know, people who are living in uh, big uh, apartments are not suffering. Everybody's suffering. I am suffering. You are suffering. People who are just uh, staying um, at home during the lockdown and it's, it's now it's been extended for another two weeks. There will be a fatigue factor. There will be men mental uh, sickness. Uh, there will be there is uh, uh, you know uh, uh, domestic increase in the number of domestic violence. Uh, there will be psychological issues. So there is there will every 
part of the society will suffer. I think the name of the game is to be patient. And uh, I hope the government and the, especially the federal government takes the right steps to uh, gradually uh, bring the society uh, back to where it was uh, before the crisis hit us. Uh, so, Han, you. you can ask a question. Yes, there is one question, one, one question from one of our organizers. Johan Hoglund. Professor uh, Johan Hoglund. And he asks yeah. that uh, Guy Stanley has proposed that people living precarious lives might organize and form what he calls the precariat. So he, uh, he wants to know whether there is any attempt within the migrant and low wage workers to organize and affect change. And if so, what does that look like? A very, very interesting question. Uh, in fact, um, many, uh, and I'm, uh, right now I'm talking about uh, middle classes of India, uh, in which I think I will include myself uh, and perhaps some of you. Uh, so I'm not saying class, middle classes. So uh, the talk, the, the, the main concern of the middle classes is that their maids are not coming to work. So they have to cook their own food. They have to clean their own toilets. They have to clean their own cars. Um, so that is their main worry, not how these workers might be uh, spending their days, what difficulties they must be in right now even though they have been working for uh, the domestic help have been working for so long for them they don't even know the addresses of these migrant of these uh, domestic help where they live uh, how they have been uh, how they live what is the standard of living uh, these these middle classes do not know and they have been working for them for years uh, and so i am hearing that these uh, these uh, people are organizing themselves uh, to demand higher wages uh, if they were to be hired as domestic help again. So they are exploited. I mean, their daily wage, they, they are like, they get probably get monthly salaries of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 rupees, which is like less than $100 a month uh, for working, for cooking food and washing dishes and cleaning, uh, you know, the toilets. They get just a meager, uh, less than a hundred uh, uh, dollars a month. So these people, if they organize themselves, which I'm hearing they are, then they are going to come very, very expensive. And they will, uh, it, I think the dignity of labor should be recognized and hopefully will be recognized in India. And perhaps they, uh, this will snowball into, uh, uh, perhaps I think uh, a bigger movement. And if this happens in big cities in India, I think the workers, uh, will find themselves uh, in a position uh, that they can bargain and they can ask for their rights uh, in a more organized manner. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, so, for such an engaging and above all humanizing session. Uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jubairji. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.